Ah, welcome. Warm yourself by the fire. Have a seat or snuggle up in your favorite spot and let me tell you a story. It was early on Christmas morning when John Riley wheeled away from a picturesque little village where he had passed the previous night to continue his cycling tour through eastern Pennsylvania. Today, his intention was to stop at Valley Forge and then to ride on up the Schuylkill Valley, visiting in turn the many points of historical interest that lay along his route. Valley Forge, his road map indicated, was but a short distance further on. All around him were the hills and fields and roads over which Washington and his half-starved army had foraged and roamed throughout the trying winters of 1777-78, 126 years ago. It was a beautiful Christmas day, truly, and as he wheeled along, young Riley's thoughts were almost equally divided between the surrounding pleasant scenery and folks at home, who he knew very well were assembling at just about the present time around a heavily laden Christmas tree in the front parlor. The sun rose higher and higher, and Riley pedaled on down the valley, passing every now and then quaint, pleasant-looking farmhouses, many of which, no doubt, had been built anterior to the period which had given the vicinity its history. Finally arriving at a place where the road forked off in two directions, Riley was puzzled which way to go. There happened to be a dwelling close by. Accordingly, he dismounted, left his wheel leaning against a gatepost at the side of the road, and walked up a wretchedly flagged walk leading to the house, with the idea of getting instructions from its inmates. Situated in the center of an unkept field of rank grass and weeds, the building lay back from the highway probably a hundred and fifty feet. It was long and low in shape, containing but one story, and having, as it is termed, a gabled roof, under which there must have been an attic of no mean size. On coming close to the house, a fact Riley had not noticed from the road became plainly evident. It was deserted. He saw that the roof and side shingles were in wretched condition, that the window sashes and frames, as well as the doors and door frames, were missing from the openings in the side walls where once they had been, and that the entire side of the house, including that part of the stone foundation which showed above the ground, was full of cracks and seams. At first, on the point of turning back, he concluded to see what the interior was like anyway. Accordingly, he went inside. Glancing around the large dust-filled room he had entered, his gaze at first failed to locate any object of the least interest. A rickety-appearing set of steps went up into the attic from one side of the apartment, and over in one corner was a large open fireplace, from the walls of which much of the brickwork had become loosened and fallen out. Riley had started up the steps towards the attic, when happening to look back for an instant, his attention was attracted to a singular-looking jug-shaped bottle no larger than a vinegar cruet, which lay upon its side on the hearth of the fireplace, partially covered up by debris of loose bricks and mortar. He hastened back down the steps and crossed the room, taking the bottle up in his hand and examining it with curiosity. Being partly filled with a liquid of some kind or another, the bottle was very soon uncorked and held under the young man's nose. The liquid gave forth a peculiar, pungent, and inviting odor. Without further hesitation, Riley's lips sought the neck of the bottle. It is hardly possible to describe the pleasure and satisfaction his senses experienced as he drank. 
while the fluid was still gurgling down his throat. A heavy hand was placed most suddenly on his shoulder, and his body was given a violent shaking. The bottle fell to the floor and was broken into a hundred pieces. Hmm. Hello, said a rough voice, almost in Riley's ear. Who are you? And what are you doing within the lines? A spy, I'll assume. As most assuredly, there had been no one else in the vicinity of the building when he had entered it, and with equal certainty, no one had come down the steps from the attic. Riley was naturally surprised and mystified by the unexpected assault. He struggled instinctively to break loose from the unfriendly grasp, and when he finally succeeded, he twisted his body around so that he faced across the room. Immediately, he made the remarkable discovery that there were four other persons in the apartment. Three uncouth-looking fellows, habited in fantastic but ragged garments, and a matronly-looking woman, the latter standing over a wash tub which had been elevated upon two chairs in a corner near the fireplace. To all appearances, the woman had been busy at her work and had stopped for the moment to see what the men were going to do. Her waist sleeves were rolled up to the shoulders and her arms dripped with water and soap suds. Over the top of the tubs, partly filled with water, there were visible the edges of several well-soaked fabrics. To add to his astonishment, he noticed that in the chimney place, which a moment before was falling apart, but now seemed to be clean and in good condition, a cheerful fire burned, and that above the flames was suspended an iron pot, from which issued forth a jet of steam. He noticed also that the entire appearance of the room had undergone a great change. Everything seemed to be in good repair, tidy and neat. The ceilings, the walls, and the door, even the stairway leading to the attic. The openings in the wall were fitted with window sashes and well-painted doors. The apartment had, in fact, evolved under his very eyesight, from a state of absolute ruin into one of excellent preservation. All of this seemed so weird and uncanny that Riley stood for a moment or two in the transformed apartment, utterly dumbfounded, with his mouth wide open and his eyes all but popping out of his head. He was brought to his senses by the fellow who had shaken him, growling out, Come on, explain yourself. An explanation is due me, Riley managed to gasp. Don't bandy words with that rascal, Harry. One of the other men spoke up. Bring him along to headquarters. Thereupon, without any further parley, the three men marched Riley in military fashion into the open air and down to the road. Here he picked up at the gatepost his bicycle while they unstacked a group of three old-fashioned-looking muskets located close by. When the young man had entered the house a few minutes before, this stack of arms had not been there. He could not understand it. Neither could he understand, on looking back at the building as he was marched off down the road, the mysterious agency that had transformed its dilapidated exterior, just as had been the interior, into a practically new condition. While they trudged along, the strangers exhibited a singular interest in the wheel Riley pushed at his side, running their coarse hands over the frame and handlebar, and acting on the whole as though they had never before seen a bicycle. This in and of itself was another surprise. He had hardly supposed that there were three men in the country, so totally unacquainted with what is now the most familiar piece of mechanism everywhere. At the same time that they were paying so much attention to the wheel, Riley in turn was studying with great curiosity his singular-looking captors. Rough, unprepossessing-appearing fellows they were, large of frame and unshaven, 
and it must be added, dirty-faced. What remained of their very ragged clothing, he had already noticed, was of a most remarkable cut and design, resembling closely the garments worn by the Continental Militiamen in the War of Independence. The hats were broad, low of crown, and three-cornered in shape. The trousers were buff-colored and ended at the knees, and the long, blue, spiked tail coats were flapped over at the extremities of the tails, the flaps being fastened down with good-sized brass buttons. Leather leggings were strapped around cowhide boots, through the badly worn feet of which, in places where the leather had been cracked open, the flesh, unprotected by stockings, could be seen. Dressed as he was in a cleanly gray cycling costume, Riley's appearance, most assuredly, was strongly in contrast to that of his companions. After a brisk walk of twenty minutes, during which they occasionally met and passed by one or two or perhaps a group of men clothed and outfitted like Riley's escorts, the little party followed the road up a slight incline and around a well-wooded bend to the left, coming quite suddenly, and to the captive very unexpectedly, to what was without a doubt a military encampment. A village, in fact, composed of many rows of small log huts. Along the streets, between the buildings, muskets were stacked in hundreds of places. Over in one corner, a slight eminence commanding the road upon which they had come, and cleverly hidden from it behind trees and shrubbery, the young man noticed a battery of field pieces, Wherever the eye was turned on this singular scene were countless numbers of soldiers, all garmented in three-cornered hats, spike-tailed coats, and knee-breeches, walking lazily here and there, grouped around crackling fires, or parading up and down the streets in platoons under the guidance of ragged but stern-looking officers. Harry stopped the little procession of four in front of one of the larger of the log houses. Then while they stood there, the long blast from a bugle was heard, followed by the roll of drums. A minute or two afterward, several companies of militia marched up and grounded their arms, forming three sides of a hollow square around them, the fourth and open side being toward the log house. Directly succeeding this maneuver, there came through the doorway of the house and, stopping directly in front of Riley, a dignified-looking person, tall and straight and splendidly proportioned of figure, and having a face of great nobility and character. The cold chills chased one another up and down Riley's back. His limbs swayed and tottered beneath his weight. He had never experienced another such sensation of mingled astonishment and fright. He was, in the presence, of General George Washington. Not a phantom Washington, either. But Washington in the flesh and blood, as material and earthly a being as ever crossed a person's line of vision. Riley, in his time, had seen so many portraits, marble busts, and statues of the great commander that he could not be mistaken. Recovering the use of his faculties, which, for the moment, he seemed to have lost, Riley did the very commonplace thing that others before him have done when placed unexpectedly in remarkable situations. He pinched himself, to make sure that he was in reality wide awake and in the natural possession of his senses. He felt like pinching the figure in front of him also, but he could not muster up the courage to do that. He stood there, trying to think it all out, and as his thoughts became less stagnant, his fright dissolved under the process of reasoning his mind pursued. To reason a thing out, 
even though an explanation can only be obtained by leaving much of the subject unaccounted for, tends to make one bolder and less shaky in the knees. The series of strange incidents which he was experiencing had been inaugurated in that old-fashioned dwelling he had visited for information concerning the roads, and everything had been going along in a perfectly normal way up to the very moment when he had taken a drink from that bottle found in the fireplace. But from that precise time, everything had gone wrongly. Hence the interference that the drinking of the peculiar liquid was accounted in some way or another for his troubles. There was a supernatural agency in the whole thing, that much must be admitted. And whatever that agency was, and however it might be accounted for, it had taken Riley back into a period of time, more than a hundred years ago, and landed him, body and soul, within the lines of the Patriot forces, wintering at Valley Forge. He might have stood there, turning over and over in his mind, pinching himself and muttering, all that morning, had not the newcomer ceased a silent but curious inspection of his person, and asked, Who are you, sir? John Riley, at your pleasure, the young man replied, adding a question on his own account. And who are you, sir? Immediately, he received a heavy thump on his back from Harry's hard fist. It is not for you to question the general the ragged administrator of the blow exclaimed. And it is not for you to be so happy, Riley returned angrily, giving the blow back with added force. Hear, hear, broke in the first questioner. Fisticuffs under my very own nose. No more of this, I command you both. To Harry, he added an extra caution. Your zeal, on my behalf, will be better appreciated by being less demonstrative. Blows should be struck only on the battlefield. To Riley, he said, with a slight smile hovering over his face, My name is Washington. Perhaps you have heard of me. To this, Riley replied, I have indeed, and I heard you very well spoken of, too. Emboldened by the other's smile, he ventured another question. I think my reckoning of the day and year is badly at fault. An hour ago, I thought the day was Christmas Day. How far out of the way did my calculations take me, sir? Hmm. The day is indeed Christmas Day, and the year is, as you must know, the year of our Lord, 1,777. Riley again pinched himself. Why do you bring this man to me? Washington now inquired, turning to Harry and his companions. Mm, he's a spy, sir, said Harry. That is a lie, Riley indignantly interpolated. I have done nothing to warrant such any charge. We found him in the widow Robin's house, pouring strong liquor down his throat. I had gone inside after information concerning the roads. Huh. Which he was getting from a bottle, sir. Hmm. Well, if drinking from a bottle of necessity constitutes being a spy, I fear our camp is already a hotbed, Washington somewhat sagely remarked, casting his eyes around slyly at his officers and men. Tell me, he went on with sudden sternness, looking at Riley through and through, as though trying to read his very thoughts. Is the charge true? Do you come from how? The charge is not true, sir. I come from no one. I, I simply am making a tour of pleasure through this part of the country on my bicycle. Hmm. With the country swarming with the men from two hostile armies... Any kind of a tour, save one of absolute necessity, seems ill-timed. When I set out, I knew nothing about any armies. The fact is, sir, 
Riley started to make an explanation, but he checked himself on realizing that the telling of any such improbable yarn would only increase the hazardness of his position. Well, Washington questioned in a tone of growing suspicion. I certainly did not know that your army or any other army was quartered in this vicinity. Riley hesitated for a lack of something further to say. You see, he finally added, prompted by a happy idea. I rode my wheel from New York. Hmm. You may have come from New York, though it is hard to believe you came on that singular-looking machine so great a distance. Where is the horse which drew the vehicle? Riley touched his bicycle. This is the horse, sir. Just as it is. The vehicle, he said. Huh. This man is crazy, Harry exclaimed. Washington only looked the incredulity he felt, and this time asked a double question. How can the thing be balanced without it being held upright by a pair of shafts from a horse's back, and how is the motive power acquired? For an answer, Riley jumped upon the wheel, and at a considerable speed and in a haphazard way, pedaled around the space within the hollow square of soldiers. Here and there he went, at one second nearly wheeling over the toes of the line of astonished, if not frightened, militiamen. At the next, bearing suddenly down on Harry and his companions and making them dance and jump about most alertly to avoid a collision. Even the dignified Washington was once or twice put to the necessity of dodging hurriedly aside when his equilibrium was threatened. Riley eventually dismounted, doing so with amused clumsiness by stopping the wheel at Harry's back and falling over heavily against the soldier. Harry tumbled to the ground, but Riley dexterously landed on his feet, and at once he began offering a profusion hmm, of apologies. You did that by design, Harry shouted, jumping to his feet. His face was red with anger, and he shook his fist threateningly at the bicyclist. Washington commanded the man to hold his peace. Then to Riley he expressed a great surprise at his performance and a desire to know more about the bicycle. The young man thereupon described the machine minutely, lifting it into the air and spinning the wheels to illustrate how smoothly they rotated. I can see it is possible to ride that contrivance with rapidity. It has been put together with wonderful ingenuity, Washington said, when Riley had replaced the wheel on the ground. And you, sir, it is but a toy, an officer spoke up. Put our friend on his bundle of tin and race him against one of our horsemen, and he would make a sorry showing. Riley smiled. I bear the gentleman no ill will for his opinion, he said. Still, I should like to show him by a practical test of the subject. Then his ignorance of it is most profound. Hmm. You would test the speed of the machine against that of a horse, Washington said in amazement. I would, sir. You have a good road yonder. With your permission and a worthy opponent. I would make the test at once. Uh, but, sir, the man is a spy, Harry broke in. Would it not be better to throw a rope around his neck and give him his just desserts? The charge is by no means proven, Washington replied, nor can it be until a court-martial convenes this afternoon. And I see no reason why we may not, in the meantime... Enjoy the unique contest which has been suggested. It would make a pleasant break in the routine of camp life. A murmur of approval went up from the masses of men by whom they were surrounded. While they had been talking, it seemed as though everybody in the camp, not already on the scene, had gathered behind the square of infantry. Then, sir, Harry said with some eagerness, 
I would like to be the man to ride the horse. There's no better animal than mine anywhere, and I understand his tricks and humors quite well enough to put him to his best pace. Well, I confess I have heard you well spoken of as a horseman, Washington said. Be away with you. Saddle and bridle your horse at once. It was the chain of singular circumstances narrated above which brought John Riley into the most remarkable contest of his life. He had entered many bicycle races at one time or another, always with credit to himself and to the club whose colors he wore. He had every expectation of making a good showing today. Yet a reflection of the weird conditions which had brought about the present contest took away some of his self-possession when a few minutes later he was marched over to the turnpike and left in his own thoughts while the officers were pacing out a one-mile straightaway course down the road. After the measurements had been taken, two unbroken lines of soldiers were formed along the entire mile a most evident precaution against Riley leaving the race course at any point to escape across the fields. Washington came up to him again, when the preparations were completed, to shake his hand and whisper a word or two of encouragement in his ear. Having performed these kindly acts, he left to take up a position near the point of the finish. The beginning of the course was located close to the battery of half-concealed field pieces. Riley was now conducted to his place. Shortly afterward, Harry appeared on his horse. He leered at the bicyclist contemptuously and said something of a sarcastic nature partly under his breath when the two lined up side by side for the start. To these slights, Riley paid no heed. He had a strong belief that when the race was over, there would be left in the mutton-like head of his opponent very little of his present inclination toward the humorous. The soldier's mount was a handsome black mare, fourteen and a half hands high, strong of limb and at the flanks, and animated by a spirit that kept her prancing around with continuous action. It must be admitted that the man rode very well. He guided the animal with ease and nonchalance when she reared and plunged, and kept her movements confined to an incredibly small piece of ground, considering her abundance of action. Keep to your own side of the road throughout the race. I don't want to be collided with your big beast, Riley cautioned while they were awaiting two signals from the starter. To this, Harry replied in some derision. Oh, hmm, I'll give you a good share of the road at the start. And all of it. And my dust, too, afterward. And then the officer, who held a pistol, fired the first shot. Riley was well satisfied with the conditions under which the race was to be made. The road was wide and level, smooth hard and straight, and a strong breeze which had sprung up blew squarely against his back. His wheel was geared up to eighty-four inches. The breeze promised to be a valuable adjunct in pushing it along. Awaiting the second signal, Riley glanced down the two blue ranks of soldiers, which stretched away into a hazy line in the distance and converged at the termination of the course where a flag had been stuck into the ground. The soldiers were at parade rest, their unceasing movements as they chatted to one another, turning their bodies this way and that and craning their heads forward to look toward the starting point and then jerking them back, made the lines seem like long, squirming snakes. At the end of the course, a thick bunch of militiamen clogged the road and overspread into the fields. The final signal to begin cracked into the air. Riley shoved aside the fellow who had been holding his wheel upright while astride of it and pushed down on the pedals, 
The mare's hooves dug into the earth, her great muscular legs straightened out. She sprang forward with a snort of apparent pleasure, taking the lead at the very start. Riley heard the shout of excitement run along the two ranks of soldiers. He saw them waving their arms and hats as he went by. And on ahead, through the cloud of dust, there was visible the shadow-like outlines of the snorting, galloping horse whose hoofbeats sounded clear and sharp above the din which came from the sides of the highway. The mare crept farther and farther ahead. Very soon, a hundred feet or more of the road lay between her and the bicyclist. Harry turned in his saddle and called out another sarcasm. "'I shall pass you very soon. Keep to your own side of the road,' Riley shouted, not a bit daunted by the way the race had commenced. His head was well down over the handlebars. His back had the shape of an a proportion of an immense egg. Up and down his legs moved faster and faster and faster yet. He went by the soldiers so rapidly that they only appeared to be two streaks of blurry color. Their sharp, rasping shouts sounded like the cracking of musketry. The cloud of dust blew against the bicyclist's head and into his mouth and throat. When he glanced ahead again, he saw with satisfaction that the mare was no longer increasing her lead. It soon became evident even that he was slowly cutting down the advantages she had secured. Harry again turned his head shortly afterwards, doubtless expecting to find his opponent hopelessly distanced by this time. Instead of this, Riley was alarmingly close to him. The man yelled a sudden oath and lashed his animal furiously. Straining every nerve and sinew, the mare, for the moment, pushed further ahead. Then her pace slackened a bit, and Riley again crept up to her, closer and closer to her than before, until his head was abreast of her outstretched tail. Harry was lashing the mare and swearing at her unceasingly now, but she had spurted once and appeared to be incapable of again increasing her speed. In this way, they went on for some little distance, Harry using his whip brutally, the mare desperately struggling to attain a greater pace, Riley hanging on with tenacity to her hind flanks and giving up not an inch of ground. A mile is indeed a very short distance when traversed at such a pace. The finishing flag was already but a few hundred feet further on. Riley realized that it was time now to go to the front. He gritted his teeth together with determination and bent his head down even further toward his front wheel. Then his feet began to move so quickly that there was only visible an indistinct blur at the sides of the crankshaft. At this very second, with a face marked with rage and hatred, Harry brought his horse suddenly across the road to that part of it that he had been warned to avoid. It is hard to tell what kept Riley from being run into and trampled underfoot. An attempt at backpedaling, a sudden twist of the handlebar, a lurch to one side that almost threw him from his seat. Then in the fraction of a second, he was over on the other side of the road, pushing ahead of the mare, almost as though she were standing still. The outburst of alarm from the throats of the soldiers changed when they saw that Riley had not been injured. First, into a shout of indignation at the dastardly attempt which had been made to run him down, and then into a roar of delight when the bicyclist breasted the flag as the winner of the race by twenty feet. As he crossed the line, Riley caught a glimpse of Washington. He stood close to the flag and was waving his hat in the air with the enthusiasm of a schoolboy. Riley went on down the road, slackening his speed as effectively as he could, but before it was possible to entirely stop his wheel's momentum, the noisy acclamations in his rear ceased with a startling suddenness. He turned in his saddle and looked back, as sure as St. Peter... He had the entire road to himself. There wasn't a soldier or 
the ghost of a soldier in sight. As soon as he could, he turned his bicycle around and rode slowly back along the highway, now so singularly deserted, looking here and there in vain for some trace of the vanished army. Even the flag, which had been stuck in the ground at the end of the one-mile race course, was gone. The breeze had died out again, and the air was tranquil and warm. In the branches of a nearby tree, two sparrows chirped and twittered peacefully. Riley went back to the place where the camp had been. He found there only open fields on one side of the road and a clump of woodland on the other. He continued on down the little hill upon which Harry and his companions had brought him a few hours previously and followed the road on further coming finally to the fork in it near which was located the old farmhouse wherein he had been taken captive. The house was as it had been when he had previously entered it, falling apart from age and neglect. When he went inside, he found lying on the brick hearth in front of the fireplace a number of pieces of broken glass. If you like these stories, please subscribe, like, and share. And as always, I thank you for listening. The End